I hope you weren't planning on eating while you watch this because it's a body horror double feature, Men and Crimes of the Future. Two films from 2022 with absolutely disgusting endings. Let's talk about some gross movies made for viewers who have a high tolerance for gore and nightmare fuel. Let's start with men. How do you feel about men? Do you love men? Do you hate men? Men. How do you feel about watching men with me? We could turn the lights off, sit in the dark together, and just watch men. By the end, men will have you going, what's going on with all these men? The trailer only had me a little concerned that men might have a heavy-handed message about how all men are trash. I knew it was from director Alex Garland, and I love his previous work with the films Ex Machina and Annihilation. Both of those films had prominent female roles, and some feminist subtext could be read into the film, but neither one was explicitly a message movie. Alex Garland doesn't consider himself an auteur. He doesn't seem to be too imposing on set. He trusts that departments like makeup, set, and costume design will turn out a better product if he lets them be creative and trust their own instincts. This being said, there are themes that are consistent throughout his films. All of the movies he's made up to this point have contained elements of horror, though his previous two were primarily science fiction stories, with Annihilation delving more into Lovecraftian territory. Men changes focus from the science fiction themes of the previous films to a story that is more of a grim folktale set in an isolated country village. The film is visually gorgeous, the shot compositions are meticulous, and the colors really pop out of the frame. The color choices are intentional from the start, with the blood-red walls of the home where our protagonist Harper will be staying for the duration of the film. Her first action upon arriving is to take a bite of an apple from a tree on the property, an obvious Garden of Eden parallel that sets up the film's Christian and pagan themes. Scrumping, eh? No, 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 no. Mustn't do that. Forbidden fruit. The idea is that there's a whole town full of creepy men, and maybe it's just one creepy man. There's also an ancient pagan deity birthed through a tunnel of the mind from the bird-like melody of a modern woman to emerge and blow magic pixie dust in her face. Men captures an eerie mood when its elements all come together. The loneliness of isolation and the pain of separation are communicated eloquently through its cinematography, editing, and music. The house that Harper is staying in feels dreamlike. When its owner Jeffrey shuts the door in the beginning, it's as though we've already departed from reality. Jeffrey is overly friendly. The actor has this great creepy smile. The film's creators referred to Jeffrey as a microaggressor. He's the least threatening of all the men in the village, but his social interactions with Harper are uncomfortable and awkward at times. He's being so nice that Harper is likely thinking, what does this guy expect in return? Garland refused to explain his film outright in an interview, but he had always wanted to make a movie about the Green Man, a figure clad in foliage and embodying the ideas of rebirth seen in surviving ancient sculptures throughout Europe. The mythological Green Man, like the Egyptian Osiris, dies and is reborn in a cycle, and lives on in our modern culture in a character like Swamp Thing. The Green Man is a vegetation deity, symbolizing the passing of the seasons, but in Men, the Green Man is an antagonist, hunting and stalking Harper. The Green Man Inn was also the name of the tavern in 1973's The Wicker Man, a slow burn horror classic about a pagan cult, and Men is a little reminiscent of that film. The men in the film are all framed through Harper's perception of them. Men opens with a scene where Harper is watching a man fall to his death. It's shot in slow motion, and the look on the man's face is almost comical. He looks afraid and pathetic in his final moments, and this is how Harper will remember him. This man was her husband, a manipulative narcissist who used his own suicide as a bargaining chip in an argument about divorce, and now Harper carries the guilt of his death on her shoulders. Playing into ideas about Christianity and sacrifice is the fact that a spike goes through her husband's hand as he hits the concrete. His pose is also reminiscent of the Hanged Man tarot card. In the creation of the film, the house was considered just as much a character as the people in the movie. It's hyper-bourgeois, Harper has fancy earpods and an electric toothbrush. 
The home is opulent and beautiful, but it's also a prison for our protagonist and a reflection of her fractured mental state. The inciting incident of men occurs when Harper journeys to an ominous tunnel after some light rainfall and sings a melody into the tunnel, hearing her little melody echo back. This melody merges into the soundtrack as the film progresses. It sounds like a religious choir. This tunnel is so deep that the audience can barely see a figure emerge at the other end. It's a rather unsettling shot. Then the figure begins to run towards Harper. The figure is eventually revealed to be the Green Man, and there's nothing scarier than a naked man. The actor wasn't actually naked if you look at the behind-the-scenes footage. His dick was added with CG. Probably less awkward on set that way, but not as realistic. I want my money back. The Green Man follows Harper home, and in a scene with some dramatic irony, he's watching her from outside the house, and she can't see that he's watching her, but we can. It's suspenseful and maybe a little darkly humorous, too. All of the men in the village are played by the same actor. It's an incredible round of performances that all feel like distinct people. The idea is that Harper has been traumatized by her husband's death that may or may not have been suicide so she's taking some time off in the country to process the events. All of the men appear the same to Harper because her perception of men has been influenced by her trauma. She sees all men as a threat. I don't think the film is trying to say that all men are violent or complicit in violence. I didn't read the film that way. It is true that men have traditionally been more violent than women, and for most of human history, women were the property of men, so there are some metaphors of historically masculine behavior at play. The film is still framed in a way in which our vision is linked to Harper's mental state and the action of the men in the town could be all part of a delusion. Men is ultimately the journey of a woman into the acceptance that it wasn't her fault that her husband was mentally unwell. The flashback scenes with her husband are shot with this reddish glow to differentiate them from the rest of the film. It captures the intensity of their argument. These are the scenes that allow the actors to really emote. Most of the film is Harper wandering around town being bewildered and confused because everyone is so weird and aggressive. These scenes give us enough context for her character without dominating the runtime. The different men represent different systems of authority. It's actually a little too obvious. There's the cop who doesn't give a damn about the naked man who's been stalking her, the friendly landlord who agrees with him, and the vicar who is intended to be the most threatening because his institution of authority is considered holy. He applies his lip balm in a really ominous way. There's also a boy with the face of a man wearing the mask of a woman, and the look of this character is just really disturbing. This man boy also gets his whole hand spliced down the middle in painfully slow detail for a cringe-inducing scene. The first scene in the film that made me uncomfortable, but certainly not the last because the ending to this one is kind of crazy. The body horror doesn't come into play until the final act, and it's going to be the most divisive part of the film. I don't even feel comfortable showing you most of the final scenes of men. The green man starts to give birth to another man through a CG vagina, and then that man gives birth to another man in an endless cycle until he's giving birth to a man's feet out of his mouth. I applaud the creativity of this scene, and it's one that could make or break a film. I think it works here, the effects artist stuck the landing, but it's also why I wouldn't recommend men for everyone. This is extreme body horror, but it's not just for shock value. It fits in with the green man archetype, and also displays the pain of giving birth and the transformation of pregnancy. It works as a body horror film in its final act, though in the events leading up to this it's more of a psychological thriller about a woman encountering a supernatural entity. The last scene of the film is deliberately open-ended. The whole film Harper has been communicating with her best friend over the phone, and experiencing disruptions with her signal. This is one of the more cliched elements of the story. The green man gives birth until he has given birth to Harper's ex-husband. Harper is ready with an axe to kill him. Perhaps she is mentally prepared to rid herself of the guilt of his death. Then the title of the film appears, followed by the folk song from the beginning, playing over Harper's friend showing up to the home. There is a cyclical nature to the film, as exhibited by the arrival of Harper's pregnant friend. Harper is holding a green leaf, staring off in a daze. When she smiles, it's not unlike the creepy smile of Jeffrey. Is this really Harper, or another reflection of the green man? Reflection has played heavily into the film. 
The Green Man first appeared in a scene where a reflection dominated the screen. The Vicar attempted to seduce Harper through a reflection. Over the credits, a dandelion is blown out in reverse, an opposite shot to the one that opened the film. It's well-crafted and poetic. Men is a beautifully made film. It does have some horror tropes, and the ending might be a deal-breaker for some. I enjoyed the previous films which Garland directed a little more than this, so I'll go with an 8 out of 10. I don't think the point of men is simply to criticize male behavior. It's about a woman's journey following her husband's suicide. Its plot is actually quite similar to The Night House. The themes are handled well with subtlety, and it creates a mood that is unsettling and mystifying. Now let's venture into the future. Crimes of the Future is the latest release from 79-year-old director David Cronenberg. I only mention his age because this movie tells me two things. Getting old sucks, and David Cronenberg does not care about making a movie that will appeal to a mass audience in the slightest. Crimes of the Future is also the name of an unrelated film that Cronenberg directed way back in 1970. His body has begun to create puzzling organs. Each one very complex, very perfect. Crimes of the Future 2022 is the most unapologetically Cronenbergian film he's made in a while. Maybe ever. Cronenberg actually wrote this film in 1996. It has a similar vibe to Videodrome, Crash, or Existence, some of Cronenberg's most bizarre and thought-provoking films. In Crimes of the Future, Viggo Mortensen is an old man named Saul who looks like either Count Dracula or a Sith Lord. His old man body is always aching because his bed needs new software. There are several scenes where he sits in this chair and it looks like it's having sex with him. In the futuristic dystopia of this film, people can't feel pain anymore so they hang out in the street and cut each other. There's a scene where Lea Sedo's character Caprice romantically tells a woman that she wants to cut her face open. Watching you suddenly fill me with the desire to cut my face open. Like Cronenberg's most famous work, this has all the makings of a cult film. It's almost so bad it's good territory. The extreme world building is a little hard to swallow. A lot of it is told through complicated dialogue and terminology. The world feels more like a vehicle for metaphors about merging the human body with technology fetishization of violence, and the problem of excess waste being produced by the human race at a rate faster than we can deal with it. The story is intriguing, bewildering even, and enjoyment of this film is going to depend greatly on your tolerance for weird old man body horror. I'd say Crimes of the Future is about the crimes committed by the human body against itself. Crimes of the Future is certainly a well-produced film, even if the story is kind of insane. The cast sounded happy just to get the chance to work with David Cronenberg. The effects don't always look great when it comes to the CG surgery scenes, but the practical effects are reminiscent of Cronenberg's classic works. The world is dirty and dingy while also being cold and clinical. I appreciate the costumes, cinematography, and lighting, even if what I'm watching unfold in front of the camera is unappealing. Viggo Mortensen's performance is hard to watch. There are these scenes where he's gagging while he talks. The usual. Then he's talking in this overly gruff film noir voice during the detective scenes. I generally like body horror, but Crimes of the Future is a little much. Some characters are looking into Viggo Mortensen with these hoses that have eyepieces on the end. It looks kind of dumb. Then there's the scene where a man covered in ears does performance art set to techno music. I don't know who thinks this is cool. I thought it was funny. I don't think it was supposed to be funny, but my reaction was to laugh. I wouldn't recommend Crimes of the Future to anyone but the most hardcore Cronenberg fan, in which case you'll probably enjoy it on some level because it's definitely his vision. You might even love it because it's so out there. Cronenberg doesn't care what's commercially viable anymore, and I respect that. One might even call it based. So I found this movie completely ridiculous. It's hard to care about these characters because it all feels unreal. The focus is on the sci-fi world building terminology, the mind and body bending concepts, and a whole bunch of torture porn. I can see where it would be hard to take any of this seriously, unless you've seen a few of Cronenberg's Stranger films, 
and then the movie makes complete sense. In Crash, the characters intentionally crashed cars for sexual pleasure. In Existence, Jude Law was hooking himself into a fleshy-looking version of the GameCube. And in Crimes of the Future, people don't feel pain anymore, so they cut each other for pleasure. It's all a little too on the nose. There's a line where a character directly says, Sex is surgery. There's a scene where Saul gets a zipper added to his body for easy access to his organs, and Caprice starts licking the opened wound. I was watching this alone, double face palming and going, No. 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 A lot of this does feel like a spiritual successor to Videodrome. Think of the scene where James Wood slipped a gun inside of his abdomen. There is a model who wears scars all over her face to challenge ideas about beauty. This whole movie is really built for the crowd who finds pleasure in pain, because everyone in this movie is a masochist. Watching this movie is a masochistic act in itself. Viggo Mortensen is a performance artist who has surgery performed on him by machines, live in front of an audience. His organs are all mutated tumors. Lea Sado is his assistant, and Kristen Stewart is part of this strange cult of people that fetishize autopsy. She's obsessed with mutated organs. Her partner looks kind of like a dollar store Jordan Peterson. There's a lot of world building in the writing, so you have to pay close attention to the dialogue. He doesn't even know. For the inner beauty pageant. Characters will be talking about concepts such as accelerated evolution syndrome and organography with institutions such as the National Organ Registry and professions like Biomorphology Coordinator. Kristen Stewart is really creepy as an accelerated evolutionary syndrome enthusiast, and Lea Sado engages in a lot of futuristic BDSM with Viggo Mortensen, but I don't have a lot to say about the acting. This is really difficult to approach material for an actor, I imagine, and everyone seems committed to their roles, which is enough for me. There aren't really great dramatic scenes in this movie, but it's not really that kind of movie to begin with. It's not exactly a drama. It's mystery, noir, horror, porn. Highly conceptual, philosophical, and offensive. As if there wasn't already enough going on, Saul gets wrapped up with an anti-government organization whose bodies have evolved with the ability to consume plastic. The government has restrictions on the evolutionary organ market, and the anti-government group advocates for unrestricted organ evolution. Some people, because of pollution and disease, I suppose, grow extra organs, and they need to be removed, but this revolutionary group thinks these new organs, and the ability to sustain off of human waste, is the future of society. As Saul becomes an informant for a government agent, the film takes on an approach that has more in common with film noir than horror. The story and the world are interesting, but something about the way it plays out in front of the camera makes it all a little hard to stomach. The film begins with a child eating a trash can, and then his mother smothers him to death. As to how this plays into the plot is not revealed until much later. The final act is with the same character in a child autopsy scene, and this is where it really takes it too far for me. I have absolutely no interest in watching a scene where a child's naked body is cut apart by machines. It's pushing boundaries of what can be shown in a film, but it doesn't make this a movie that I would want to re-watch or show to a friend. Worst first date movie ever. To sum up the plot, a famous performance artist in the future has his extra organs removed on stage. He lives in a world with no pain, where cutting has become the only form of sexual gratification. Sex is referred to as the old sex, and no one does that anymore. The government restricts these new organs that people are growing, but a subversive revolutionary group believes these new organs are the next step in evolution. In the future, we're all going to eat paste and protein bars made out of toxic waste. This performance artist is some kind of secret agent informing the government about this anti-government group. In the final act, the leader of the group's son is cut apart live on stage, and it turns out the organs were not grown naturally, but surgically integrated into the dead child's body. Meaning that the child is not the next step in evolution, but it turns out he actually was, and the government staged the whole event to dissuade the public from learning about the benefits of accelerated evolution syndrome. Two chicks show up and drill through the skull of the rebel leader, who doesn't look like much of a rebel leader, by the way. The performance artist decides he will no longer work with the cops, 
and disappears into the shadows, presumably to join the revolutionary plastic eaters. Then, he sits in his fleshy love chair and eats the poison cliff bar. Did any of that make sense? Crimes of the Future layers weirdness on top of weirdness. It's a movie that is said to have received generally positive reviews from critics, but keep in mind that film critics don't always praise movies that are easily digestible. And Crimes of the Future goes down about as easy as a candy bar made out of human waste. God bless you, David Cronenberg. You're a sick freak and I love it, but I don't love this movie. Some might say the only crime involved with Crimes of the Future is that the movie was even made at all. Some viewers might find this to be one of the worst movies they'll see all year, but at least it's not boring. At least the director has a vision for the film, and it fits nicely into his larger body of work. I'll give Crimes of the Future a 6 out of 10, despite the fact that I would only recommend this one to a select group of weirdos. Weirdos like me.